Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Carly Leggett, the Executive Director here at the George and Fahey Center for Healthcare Innovation. We are pleased to have partnered today with Shared Health Manitoba for this presentation, Asking the Right Questions Leads to the Right Actions. This session is one of the many Canadian Patient Safety Week events that Shared Health is putting on as um, part of this year's theme, Safer Care for Older Adults. I want to start today by acknowledging that the Center for Healthcare Innovation and the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Ojibwe Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples and the homeland of the Red River Métis. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and present. And we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to introduce our two speakers today. I'd first like to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Reinholz, who's an internal medicine specialist subspecializing in geriatric medicine. She did her medical school and core internal medicine residency at the University of Saskatchewan and her subspecialty geriatric medicine training at the University of British Columbia. She then moved to St. John, New Brunswick, where she was a community, community geriatrician. For the last six years, she's been a community geriatrician in the Prairie Mountain Health region living here in Burden, Manitoba. She does comprehensive geriatric assessments in person or by telehealth in patient homes, in personal care homes, and during subacute hospitalizations outside of Brandon. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she's been the interim regional personal care home medical director supporting the COVID-19 outbreak responses. She is also the co-chair of the provincial clinical team for primary care community and seniors. Her areas of interest include supporting healthcare teams to identify older adults living with frailty and implement enhanced care strategies to meet the needs of this patient population. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Phil St. John, who grew up in Minidosa, Manitoba, and is a professor in the section of geriatric medicine, Department of Internal Medicine, and is the head of the section of geriatric medicine at the University of Manitoba. He did his MD here at the U of M, a rotating internship at Memorial University in Newfoundland, internal medicine training at the University of Manitoba, and his subspecialty training at the University of Ottawa. He obtained a master's in public health and epidemiology from Johns Hopkins University. Dr. St. John's research interests are rural health, the epidemiology of cognitive loss, frailty, and depression. He's an affiliate of the Center on Aging at the University of Manitoba, the co-lead of the Manitoba site of the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, and a co-investigator with the Manitoba Follow-Up Study. His clinical practice is as a consultant geriatrician cited at Health Sciences Centre and Deer Lodge Centre here in Winnipeg. Welcome to you both, and I believe I'm handing it over to Dr. Reinhold to start. Thank you very much for the introductions and uh, land acknowledgement. I'll start with uh, my conflict of uh, interest statement, and I'll just note that I'm not a fee-for-service geriatrician, so any recommendations for comprehensive geriatric assessments do not change my personal income. I'm the co-chair, as mentioned, of the uh, provincial clinical team, so um, motivated for improvements at a uh, provincial level, and I do not receive any income from for-profit entities. Yeah, so I am a fee-for-service geriatrician, uh, so any recommendations I make do, do change my income. Um, I don't have any major conflicts of interest. I'm an employee of the University of Manitoba, and I, I work with Shared Health um, and have um, grant support, but, but uh, not from industry. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, mention where I got the uh, pictures throughout my presentation. Um, and there's a, a UK initiative for collecting uh, photographs that can be used to reflect uh, positive aging. And I think it's relevant to say that uh, because it's a UK source of pictures, it doesn't um, absolutely uh, represent the, um, the uh, populations that we're working with here in Manitoba, but maybe that's a challenge for us to, um, you know, contribute uh, healthy aging uh, photographs uh, for our use that do reflect our um, populations in uh, Manitoba. So today we're going to try to um, introduce or, or um, scratch the surface of some uh, topics, including how uh, understanding how the clinical frailty scale can be efficiently used to stage underlying frailty of older adults and uh, um, touch on how this can help with some of the pressures that we have that can result in biased thinking. 
we'll uh, list the geriatric 5Ms and uh, understand how changes in the 5Ms over time help to refine a diagnosis and treatment plans, and then use delirium as an example of uh, geriatric syndrome and talk about identifying delirium in patients um, and recognize how the assessment and multifactorial treatment of delirium demonstrates some of the principles we're trying to get at about tailoring care to meet the needs of older adults. Um, while we're going, um, if there's a burning question, uh, there are people who can monitor for hands and, and you can unmute and ask. But also, if you have questions, um, you can type them in the chat and the one of us who isn't speaking can try and answer the questions uh, in the chat or um, sort of flag it for uh, time uh, Hopefully when we, no, we will have time for questions as we finish the uh, slides. So I just want to set the scene that we're all under a lot of uh, uh, pressures at uh, work and um, fast medicine is, is um, something that I don't know really exists in our world, but would be black and white uh, medicine where you have all the, the data that you need and all the points are pointing in the same direction and you know exactly what to do, um, or um, you have to make a decision right now and uh, there just isn't time to gather more information. And this, this work certainly can be um, very satisfying uh, and fulfilling if it meets the patient needs, and it certainly is efficient in the rare circumstances when this kind of medicine comes up, but realistically, this is where we are living most of the time. All of uh, our patients can be considered pixels in this, uh, these gradients, and uh, they are somewhere on a spectrum from low complexity to high complexity, and their needs are somewhere on a spectrum between low acuity and high acuity, and those um, simple low complexity make up a very small proportion of what we do, and those folks where there's absolutely no time to gather more information make up a very small amount uh, of the people that we are trying to help. Instead, we are at risk of having pressures for fast thinking, trying to meet the needs of these patients, but usually um, we need more data points. Uh, and, and what I'm hoping is the uh, take home after uh, today is that we need way more information than, uh, than age. Um, and often uh, we know that these patients may benefit from enhanced multifactorial interdisciplinary care, but we are under pressures that we don't have enough time and we don't have enough of all of the various resources for um, all of the uh, patients with needs. And so there is some need to prior prioritize. The um, risks, uh, as I sort of mentioned of fast thinking is that these are the circumstances that can lead to biased thinking. And I was introduced to this when I was lucky enough to participate in the second cohort of the Stanford Wellbeing Director course, because it actually is related to some of the risk factors for healthcare provider burnout and lack of satisfaction in our work when we feel that we have to um, do fast thinking. And um, some of the activators of bias include stress, time constraints, multitaskings, and need for closure, which I think can resonate with uh, many of us. The fast thinking can result in microaggressions, and this word can come up in a lot of work, including uh, diversity and inclusion um, work. But I'm going to mention the sort of definition today and, and ask you to think about in, the, in, the, in terms of meeting the needs of older adults. So microaggressions are brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, and environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional that communicates hostile, derogatory, or negative slights or insults. And sometimes in our efforts to be efficient, um, the person receiving care may interpret some of the choices being made on their behalf in this lens of microaggressions. So for more information, um, you can go to um, this website for the Joint Commission about cognitive biases in healthcare. And that's where I pulled out these factors that can predispose. And I think, Many of us are working in situations where we have to take those extra steps to combat that. I'll note the slides will be available and uh, maybe some of these links may uh, appear in the, the chat, but certainly hoping you'll have access to the live links in uh, the slides.
specific to the risk of using age um, and fast thinking, this can result in an attribution bias, which is defined as a form of stereotyping, explaining a patient's condition on the basis of their predisposition or character, rather than seeking a valid medical explanation, or in the case of complex uh, older adults, uh, multiple um, valid medical explanations. And this is one of the biases summarized in the uh, CMPA Good Practices Guide um, with the link here. And their um, recommendation, coming back to the focus of today's talk, is to combat that, the important thing is to gather sufficient information. So when trying to pick who amongst all the uh, very um, worthy patients we're working with um, may benefit most from our time gathering more information, I'd like to propose that as an alternative to age, identifying how frail somebody is may be a better model. So frailty, um, as summarized by the Canadian Frailty Network, is a medical condition of reduced function and health in older individuals. And this uh, makes people more susceptible to large declines in health. Is anybody else hearing some feedback? Um, more susceptible to large declines in health from minor illnesses such as flu or adverse events like falls and more likely to be hospitalized, need long-term care or die. And being uh, uh, living with frailty is a common um, occurrence in Canada. And I'll just uh, sort of guide you to this middle one that um, 1 1.6 million Canadians age 65 and better are living with frailty. And that's one in four of Canadians age 65 and older. So how do we go about identifying who's living with frailty? Um, I can say that um, judging from the end of the bed with uh, people say in the emergency department or an acute care bed where you're wearing a Johnny shirt and your hair is all disarrayed uh, is not gonna be the um, um, best way to judge uh, how frail a person is. There are three main models evolving for identifying frailty. Uh, one is an accumulating deficits model where you basically count up the challenges the person is living with medically, functionally, socially. And, uh, and the more you have, uh, the, the more likely it is that you're living with frailty. There's a physiologic phenotype where you do some specific measurements. And if you have X number, then this um, um, it indicates you're living with a syndrome of, of frailty. And then there's the clinical frailty scale, which is based on some overall effect on your function um, that indicates the sum total effects of all of the challenges you're living with. And this is what we're going to be focusing on most today. So there is validated operationalization of frailty assessments. And we're going to focus on the clinical frailty scale it was validated against a research tool called the Frailty Index, which is uh, aligns with this accumulating deficits model of frailty. And I would encourage you for sort of new tools as they become available, but also the sort of the home uh, for the clinical frailty scale to go to the Dalhousie University website, um, as this has been a focus of their uh, geriatric medicine research for years now. I'm not going to summarize all the available evidence, but I do want to highlight sort of the um, landmark uh, trial that was confirming the predictive values of the clinical frailty scale. This work was done by Rockwood and his uh, colleagues and published in 2005. And it was um, uh, used the Canadian study on health and aging data, which um, uh, followed Canadian 65 years of age and better for five years after assessment of their frailty using the clinical frailty scale. And basically every step frailer on the scale resulted in a 20% increased risk of institutionalization and uh, probability of, uh, of uh, death in the case of becoming more frail. In 2014, uh, Bagshaw et al. published um, some results using the clinical frailty scale in the ICU setting for people 65 years in age and better from six hospitals in Alberta. Similarly, there was this stepwise decrease in survival 
as there was increasing uh, frailty. And this uh, paper has been uh, quoted a lot recently when talking about how to um, 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 identify who may do better um, with COVID related to ICU um, based on how frail the person was before they got sick. And this has been studied in pick your favorite um, healthcare um, health uh, condition. And I've just outlined uh, some of the uh, papers that um, summarize for dialysis, the effects on mortality, um, the risk of hospitalization, uh, the risks of institutionalization, and it all is very much falling along the same. There are no outliers amongst uh, chronic and acute medical conditions. So I did want to take a moment to get into some of the details of using the clinical frailty scale. This is uh, oper operationalized by clinicians talking to the patient and or the family uh, for collateral information. So it isn't about looking at blood tests. It isn't about a scan that's going to tell you this. It is from the uh, history. And it doesn't stand alone. So there aren't sort of just functional questions that alone are going to be able to um, give you an accurate picture of the degree of frailty a person is living with. Instead, it's part of, or it can be done effectively after a clinical assessment. But this clinical assessment is work we're already doing. So between the nursing assessment and the medical assessment, there is this information if you supplement it with how things have been changing over time and how the collection of difficulties is affecting functional independence. And I would encourage you again on the Dalhousie website just to think about doing the 20 minute online certification, which gives you some feedback um, as you're learning how to do this and you get a certificate at the end. There's also an app that can help um, you sort of walk through the questions. The people who are living with frailty using this clinical frailty scale are the people who have five to eight on the scale. And just briefly, people who are clinical frailty scale five are living with mild frailty, and they are starting to need some help with the high order instrumental activities of daily living. So things they used to be able to do, they're now needing some help. Perhaps it's with transportation, perhaps it's with heavy housework. Um, and they, they, they often have some slowing up. It's more effortful or taking uh, more time. People living with moderate frailty are starting to need some help, some cueing, or would benefit from but are not accepting some help with their personal hygiene. So it's not just affecting what it takes to live in the community independently. It's starting to affect their, looking after their own personal hygiene. Clinical frailty scale seven is people living with severe frailty and they are becoming completely dependent for their personal care and all of their IADLs. But they're not expected to die imminently or, you know, you'd be surprised if you say they're on the ward and you heard they, they had, um, or maybe not the ward, that's an unfair, but say you were following them in the community or they were living in a personal care home receiving that level of care, you'd be surprised if you came in the morning and you heard that they had died. This is to differentiate them from people living with very severe, severe frailty, who are a clinical frailty scale eight, and they are completely dependent, but approaching the end of life. And often we're missing those opportunities to have the conversation when the healthcare team recognizes we wouldn't be surprised if they died tomorrow or in the next couple of weeks. Um, but maybe the families are not aware of the degree of frailty they're living with. I'm just going to highlight that nine does not follow sequentially from eight. So people who are a clinical frailty scale nine, this was actually added on after the early versions of the clinical frailty scale, because these are people who have a terminal condition expected to die within six months, but may be very functionally independent right now. They simply don't fit this progression of frailty that increases the likelihood of mortality because their mortality is being driven by another cause.
And I want to highlight that it's important when working in acute care settings and in, in the community with people living in their homes to not forget about the uh, large number of people, uh, three, um, three quarters of the uh, older adults uh, who are living with uh, vitality. So the clinical frailty scale one to three, who range from uh, managing well, maybe they have well-controlled memory problems or medical problems, um, but continue to be active and do everything for themselves, all the way up to the very remarkable people who are energetically exercising regular, who are the very fittest of their age. And if they have an unfortunate blown knee while they're running a marathon, they may not look their best. They may appear even uh, low weight from what we're used to because they exercise so much, but their, um, um, the optimism of their outcomes is much higher than people who are living with frailty. I mentioned that there is an app and this is what the screenshots look like. It walks you three, through. Again, just asking these questions in isolation is not going to result in the most accurate it is as part, these questions are part of the rest of the clinical assessment. And there's been a lot more experience in recent, uh, the last couple of years as non-specialized uh, geriatric services have been using the clinical frailty scale more and more. And a tips sheet has been um, added to the geriatric medicine uh, Dalhousie website uh, with some of the important learnings. So I'll just highlight with the yellow arrow that many of these come down to the excellence in communication to do this work right. So just to highlight, it's about the baseline. So when somebody is acutely ill, their functional dependence in that moment is not how you're judging their underlying frailty. Instead, it's best to be asking about two weeks before they became um, acutely ill. You have to take a uh, proper history. We've already talked about that. Trust but verify, which is the respectful way of saying that you definitely want the patient's opinion about how they have uh, been doing, but it is also important, um, particularly as the um, concerns that there could be cognitive impairment, to get other sources of information to verify. And I'll just skip, although they're all important points, over to um, you know having medical problems. Your past medical history is not you know the the thing that predicts how frail you are, but instead it's the symptoms you're experiencing. So you have to ask about the way in which um, symptoms from those underlying conditions are affecting frailty, and. It's important not to forget the clinical frailty scale four. Those are the folks in that transition from living with vitality to living um, with frailty, and they may be becoming more vulnerable um, as if they're progressing into um, living with frailty. So what do we do once we know that someone is living with frailty? And there are a collection of things that become more important. And today we're, pri we're talking about prioritizing communication excellence. And I'm just going to give a shout out to Dr. Donay, who is a neurologist who was working at U of S during my um, training years. And he was the one who really brought home to me that the importance of gathering the symptoms to give an idea of the anatomic location of pathology. But then the timeline says, what kind of pathology is underlying the change? Are these changes happening slowly or quickly? Gives you an idea what's causing the problems. So applying this principle, I kind of hear him in my head, applying this to frailty. This is where the communication excellence is about gathering comprehensive information with timelines. Uh, because people living with frailty often have atypical presentations. And again, sorry to bring it up again, but with COVID, we know that people living with frailty had atypical presentations, including falls, including delirium, um, you know, and may have uh, not had the obvious respiratory uh, symptoms uh, and, and a rip-roaring fever that might be more common in older, adult, uh, in younger or people living without frailty. <clears throat> 
So where do you even start on this comprehensive information? And the Canadian Geriatric Society, working with the American Geriatric Society and British Geriatric Society, have all been endorsing the five M's, um, which is a, a way to summarize what is comprehensive geriatric uh, information. And I'll say that these are, um, um, this framework um, identifies people who may, or who are going to benefit from interdisciplinary care and gathering this information about these matters most, mind, mobility, medication, and multi-complexity will also benefit from interdisciplinary teamwork. This is where, you know, you don't have to feel like you are gathering all of this information independently. And in fact, it can be annoying to patients and families if we don't work as a team to gather any of the information and all repeat the questions over and over again. It's important to assume that all um, changes are multifactorial and um, recognize the increased vulnerability to poor outcomes. And I think these five M's and recognizing the importance of an enhanced frailty history helps to combat failure uh, to cope, which really is a bit of a failure to think uh, diagnosis when, when we just put um, this label onto um, an admission instead of digging into what's really uh, going on. This is by, by trying to better define what's going on, you avoid a premature closure cognitive bias, which is an uncritical acceptance of an initial diagnosis and failing to search for information to challenge the provisional diagnosis or to consider other diagnoses. And the what's in it for me, for healthcare providers, is that um, often we have the unsatisfying feeling of, am I missing anything? So digging into an enhanced frailty history can help to avoid that unsettling feeling that what if I'm missing something? I've listed some examples of different questions that fall into each of these categories, um, but I'm going to sort of skip over them in the interest of time. But each of these topics then um, lends itself to part of um, the, the assessment history. And I'll just highlight this last one under multi-complexity because sometimes we hone in on those high yield screening questions very specific to presenting complaints. These are the folks who benefit from that review of systems, specifically asking about other things they're experiencing in case it's all connected. And you know, this is, I'm, I'm now going on to a more specific area of talking about but delirium because it really exemplifies much of this approach that I've been trying to talk about. So it's an example of a geriatric giant, which means that people living with frailty are at increased risk of this uh, condition, specifically delirium here. The factors contributing to any individual's delirium are multifactorial and unique to them. People experiencing delirium benefit from an interdisciplinary approach to their care. And the treatment and prevention of delirium requires a multifactorial uh, approach. So diagnosis of delirium starts with timely and excellent communication. It can't wait until some specific allied health or referral service can start digging into the details two weeks from now. This really is about excellence right from the get-go of their admission or initial assessment with an acute change. Few highlights from delirium. I just want to highlight that there was a recent guideline, March 2019, released in Scotland called the Sign 157, and I think it really is um, the most current, up-to-date information available on delirium. They define it as delirium is an acute deterioration in mental functioning arising over hours or days that's triggered mainly by acute medical illness. And I'll just expand that to illnesses. Again, multiple contributing factors. Delirium is independently linked with poor outcomes, including medical complications, falls, etc. Again, highlighting the way it aligns with um, um, the uh, geriatric syndrome, and it is among the most common medical emergencies, why, which is why I've chosen to highlight it today, uh, what proportion of those people 
admitted with a failure to cope could be better described even by just identifying that they have delirium, if not the contributing um, factors to their delirium. A UK study found that the prevalence of 20% in adult acute general medical patients and 50% of those with hip fractures, 75% in intensive care, several predisposing factors, including frailty. And I just went, you know, digging for a recent um, quote on how much frailty increases the rate in a meta-analysis from 2018 suggested that the that living with frailty increases your relative risk 2.19. So lots of great information in this guideline. It's from Healthcare Improvement Scotland. Um, if you are interested in delirium, uh, following uh, Alistair McCulloch on uh, Twitter, he often is tweeting out um, really current uh, stuff. And again, because we're talking about communication today, they specifically highlight patient and carers' perspectives were sought for this guideline. And there's a common concern raised by patient groups and through research into patient and carer issues identified good communication with family members or carers are crucial specific to delirium. This guideline also introduces the 4AT. Many of you may be familiar with the confusion assessment method. I just want to you know, share that there's another tool out there being validated in a number of settings. The website, which if you go to this sign decision support, has the link. Um, and and it gives a bit more guidance, is a little more concrete about how to operationalize a delirium screening. And again, the first three are operationalized by talking to the patient. And this identifies the need to get some collateral from family or other collateral collateral who can comment about ways in which this is a change for the individual. So again, this comprehensive approach avoids further biases, including anchoring, search satisfaction, and bandwagon effect uh, biases. Not that any of us go to work hoping that we're going to, to, to be biased in our work, but recognizing we're under pressures that result in us um, um, unintentionally having some biased thinking, and this can combat some of the, the things that any one of us on any given day may feel pressured um, into. The uh, guideline does have a lovely outline of, of things that are involved in risk reduction and, and also um, the, the things in, that are important for the non-pharmacologic treatment of delirium. Again, I just wanted to highlight this because of the comprehensive need to not just give antibiotics for one specific thing in order for delirium treatment to be successful as with treating anything in older adults living with frailty, you need to address all of um, these multifactorial things for their outcomes to be the best possible. So I've made it sound that simple, um, but this is an evolving field and it is um, complicated, satisfying, but hard work. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. St. John for some uh, further, uh, further information and, and uh, thank you. Great, thanks. Right, so um, life is complicated and geriatrics is known for accepting complexity. Um, so frailty is a complex subject and there's some controversies around it. So um, next slide, please. I thought I'd touch on some of those. So next slide. So the first point is there's multiple definitions of frailty. So over time, the, the notion of frailty has evolved and the definitions have evolved. Um, and there have been multiple consensus conferences where people have tried to reach a consensus and each different group came out uh, believing they're, they were correct. Um, so next slide. So the two major measures of frailty, there are a million of them, but the two major ones in medicine right now are what, uh, what Dr. Reinhold alluded to, the accumulation of deficits model, which is also called the Canadian model of frailty, uh, because Ken Rockwood is Canadian, or the Rockwood model of frailty. The major competing model is called the Freed model after Linda Freed, or the American model, or most commonly the, the phenotype uh, model of frailty. And in this notion, frailty is a distinct entity. So it's not simply the accumulation of deficits. It's not simply a person who acquires 
risk factors, diseases, then functional impairment, and then and then um, or end organ failure. Um, it's rather a distinct entity, and it's characterized by what we would call physical performance measures. So weight loss, exhaustion, uh, slowness, so gait speed forever has been known to predict poor outcomes, a low activity level and uh, low grip strength. And again, all of these are independently predicted with a poor outcome, but if you collectively put them together, um, it, it becomes even more predictive. So the other competing model is this one of Linda Fried. So the main point is in academics, there's really no major consensus as to what frailty is. Next slide. Next slide. I can't advance the slides. Um, the older model, which I personally kind of like actually, is this one, um, again, from, from Rockwood, based upon Brocklehurst earlier. And this sees a person as being in a precarious balance. So they're not actually suffering from disability or severe illness or dependence. Um, but they're at high risk of that happening. And on the other side of the ledger, or the scale, are positive things. So good health, um, attitudes towards health and good health practices, resources, financial, family, and so forth, as well as caregiving. So the notion is that a frail person is in balance, but very vulnerable to tipping. And I think this model is nice because one, it stresses the dynamic nature of frailty, so it's not static, it can change. Two, if a person becomes more ill and has more deficits, you can address that by reducing the deficit load potentially, or by putting in more resources, um, be they social or, or medical or psychological. So that was the older model and it's been supplemented by the, the other two models. Next slide, please. What everybody agrees on, and this is I think the key point in geriatrics, we often get caught up on how to define it. And um, we have these kind of discussions about what it is, but I think the key point upon which everyone can agree is that frailty is a state of vulnerability to adverse outcomes. And the other key point is it's all sorts of vulnerable outcomes. So if you want to, if you're from nursing, you can think of, um, you know, the charts, I'm just reviewing a bunch of charts and looking at the fall prevention um, fall risk scale, and then you can look at the pressure sore risk scale, you can look at the length of stay risk scale, you can look at the prediction of death uh, scales, and they all look a real, a real lot like a frailty score, uh, predict the frailty index. So everybody agrees that frailty is a state of vulnerability, and it's not just a one outcome, it's to multiple outcomes. The second key point is that frail older adults or older adults living with frailty, um, have decreased reserves to, with which to compensate for or recover from stressors. And then the other thing is to accept complexity. So, you know, we may not like complexity, but it's there and we have to accept it. And the key point is that there's multiple risk factors operating over multiple long time frames. Um, okay, next slide, please. So it's no surprise that academics disagree because people on the street disagree. So these are data from the, the Manitoba follow-up study. So a study of initially 3,983 uh, men who qualified for air crew training um, in the Second World War. Um, and Bob Tate is the, the primary investigator now. Um, in 2015, we just added on a question, how do you define frailty? Um, and then coded it. And the key points are one, the, there's a lot of heterogeneity in how people define frailty. So in the older men um, defined it in a variety of ways. Some had a completely idiosyncratic one. I, I, at least two of them obviously just went to the dictionary and, and copied it. Um, but a whole bunch of them had fairly idiosyncratic uh, definitions. Many didn't match any existing theory. Um, and some of them sided with uh, Team Rockwood and some of them sided with Team Freed. So I think it's important to know that when we say frailty, we should actually think about what people hear when we say it. Um, next slide, please. The other key point is that the progression of frailty is, is critical. So um, time horizons are exceptionally important. Um, and again, uh, Dr. Reinhold uh, alluded to this, but the key point is that we're all on a trajectory of, of some functional decline. So that would be the, the line at the top. But at no point, simply because of age, do we become, do, do, do we wind up with a, a disability? 
Um, so age alone, it does not cause functional impairment. However, age alone does reduce our, our physical performance a little bit. But if you add in a chronic disease, they go onto the line that's numbered two um, at, a, at a more rapid functional decline. Um, and then if you add in an acute stressor, you have the sudden decline. And we have to be very cognizant of that. And just to state the obvious, acute problems cause acute functional declines and chronic problems cause chronic functional decline. And in the heat of the moment, that's often forgotten. So we have to think about not only where the person is now, but where they have been. And it's often tempting to look at their functional status um, in the emergency without considering how they got there. Um, and this leads to this notion of atypical presentation. So often older adults with frailty or without frailty actually can present with an atypical presentation such as acute cognitive decline or delirium, acute functional decline, or this horrible nefarious term of, of failure to cope, um, um, or acute incontinence or acute change in mobility. So we have to think of not only where they are now, but how they got there, and then how they're going to recover. So that would be the third line, um, and enabling them hopefully to get on the, the third line that goes up, not, not the one that goes down. Next slide, please. Um, now, the other notion is there is this notion that, that as people become frail, um, their quality of life drops dramatically, and that's really not the case. So these are data from the Manitoba Study of Health and Aging, which was done in conjunction with the uh, uh, Canadian Study of Health and Aging. And, and many of you, I noticed, have probably have worked with Pat Montgomery, but he and I looked at these data and found that there is a very strong association between life's overall life satisfaction and, uh, and, and frailty, but, but not as strong as you'd think in terms of the overall life satisfaction. There's quite a strong satisfaction with how satisfied are you with your health question, but it's not like the other domains are, are, are dramatically uh, impacted. So self-esteem remains pretty good. Um, family relationships remain pretty good. Friendships remain pretty good. Housing remains pretty good. Um, so it's important to know that, that life satisfaction can, can be maintained even in the face of frailty. Next slide. And this is five years later, um, so the associations are still there. Um, the strongest ones are for health and recreation. But again, overall life satisfaction is fairly maintained in people with living with frailty. Um, so despite uh, frailty, people have, have fairly good life satisfaction. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> the other issue that's come up is the use of the clinical frailty scale as resource allocation. And it's not actually clearly documented what happened. And interestingly, it's increasingly hard to find the, the policy papers as they dis disappear from websites um, in, 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 in the UK. Um, but in the UK, um, at the height of the COVID pandemic, it's not clear if it was a recommendation or if it actually happened, um, but certainly there was a policy paper put out by the National Institute for Clinical Excellence suggesting that the clinical frailty scale be used to, um, to um, uh, determine who would get into ICU and who didn't um, at the height of the pandemic in, in, in the UK. And this um, raised a fair bit of controversy, I guess, since we're talking about Britain, controversy um, or controversy around, around the use. And several points came up. One is how the clinical frailty scale was used. So it was often used higgledy-piggledy in the heat of the moment without considering their baseline, but just looking at the person in the moment. Secondly, it was used as a standalone instrument, not as part of a clinical assessment. So I think it's really important to realize that the clinical frailty scale should follow a full clinical assessment and incorporate those observations. It is not a standalone test like an EKG or a CAT scan. Um, it, it is part of a, of a clinical assessment. Um, and we have to consider also how the person got there. The third big con controversy was the cut point 
So if you go back and think to the clinical frailty scale from a few slides ago, the cut point that was suggested was three, which I think people felt was um, a, little, um, a little high. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Um, and then the fourth point is which clinical frailty scale. So the original frailty scale was a seven point scale. Um, and the, then it was adapted to a nine point scale and we're now in 2.0, which is a nine point scale with the categories changed a little bit. So it was never really clear which clinical frailty scale people were talking about when they were talking about using it to, to allocate scarce resources like ICU. And the fifth controversial point um, was, should we be using frailty at all? Um, and there is quite a strong backlash that frailty should not be considered um, in, in, in acute care resource allocation in, in, in the setting of a, a major pandemic. Um, although the detractors did not really have a, an alternate uh, suggestion of what to use uh, when, when ICs become overwhelmed. So um, that, that, that was one of the situations that was a good example of how the clinical frailty scale can be used a bit controversially uh, for an intent for which it was never intended. Next slide, please. Well, so what? So this is from the Onion magazine quite a while ago. <laughs> Sorry to tell you how long I've been doing this talk. Um, and, and basically, in medicine in general, but certainly in geriatrics, rarely are there quick, simple fixes that solve the problem. Most of the time, it's adjustments that are very important in multiple domains that are relatively straightforward, appear to be obvious once you say them, but are often overlooked. Um, and often the goal is to improve quality of life and functioning rather than to, to enhance survival. Uh, so next slide, please. So just to bang our own drum, I guess, one thing that's very important is geriatric assessment. There's just a massive evidence of, of, for, for the benefits of comprehensive geriatric assessment that I won't talk about. All of it is randomized clinical trials. Secondly, exercise. Um, so there are at least three big randomized clinical trials showing what the, Amer these is directly from the American Geriatric Society slides um, or recommendations. It's actually not, so I wouldn't call it a modest increase in mobility and function. The number to treat treats kind of 33, which if exercise were a drug, we'd be calling spectacular. Um, but it is, I guess it, it is an increase. So exercise alone does reduce the risk of, of functional impairment and frailty. Um, and there's a lot of research on nutrition. Next slide, please. I think there's questions for the future. One is we actually don't know how much frailty changes over time. Um, we don't know the course. Um, we do know that once you get into the very significant stages of frailty, no matter how you measure it, 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 it doesn't go up. Um, we do know that, but we don't know how frailty changes over time or the predictors of a more rapid or more slow course. We also don't know much about the life course approach. So what factors about you at 25 and 35 and 50 predict late life frailty, if, if any. Um, we don't know the effect of social circumstances on frailty. Um, we know that frailty is much more prevalent in people who have low incomes, like much more prevalent. Um, so there's a very strong social gradient in the risk of frailty, but we don't know um, how that would change over time, say with pension reform and so forth in many, in many countries. Um, we don't know much about, apart from exercise and comprehensive geriatric assessment, how to prevent frailty. Um, we're increasingly knowing what the value or non-value actually of interventions is in those who are living with frailty. Um, and the last point is we really don't know much about the order in which assets um, or deficits accumulate. Um, so those are kind of the future directions for questions that are, are open questions. Uh, next slide, please. So why is it important? Well, clinicians, well, you know, one of the famous geriatricians, Roy Fox, used to say we need to um, embrace complexity. <clears throat> well, whether you embrace it or not, it's there. We have to accept it. So, <clears throat> you know, we're living in a complex world with complex patients. Best 
that we embrace it, but at least we have to accept it. We also need to have understand that there's multiple problems in multiple domains that have been happening over quite a long time period, and we have to be able to disentangle those. Um, so we need to be able to sort out which issue is due to what risk factor, and that takes time and a lot of thinking. But we can't lose track of the big picture. So we need, in geriatrics, we kind of need a zoom lens. So we need to be able to zoom in and see all the detail and have long detailed problem lists. But we really also need to zoom out and see what the whole big picture of the person is. Um, and we also need to assess more than just medical factors. And that, that again, this would seem to be blindingly obvious um, to, 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 to everybody, but we really do need to assess functional status, cognition, mood, and social factors. And again, it, it just sounds blindingly obvious that we should be doing that, but, but we, we, know, we know what a world level we're not. So next slide, please. Um, so we have to have a team approach. We need to consider short-term and long-term goals. So we need to think about where someone's gonna be in the next few days, the next few months, and, and the next few years. And we need to understand the trajectory. So I don't know anything about hockey at all, but I know Wayne Gretzky said, you wanna skate where the puck is gonna be, not where it is. So we do need to think about where the person's gonna be in six months and nine months, um, not just today. And then we need to understand what matters most. So the one of the M's in, in the five M's. And it's not too hard to sort that out just by asking. Um, and, and we need to ask them and, and their families. Most older people can tell us what they want. Next slide, please. Administrators, well, again, whether we like it or not, complex people need complex systems and we have to have a system that accepts that complexity. We have to have coordination between care settings. Um, Right, so case mix adjustment. So if we're talking about length of stay, obviously length of stay is very strongly correlated with the frailty level of the person. So if we're gonna set a length of stay, we cannot use a disease-based measure alone. Just That's just ridiculous. We, we have to use measures that we know predict in hospital outcome, obviously. Um, and then the other last point is that humans are heterogeneous. We're heterogeneous in our health status, our functional status, our cognitive status. Consequently, we're going to have heterogeneous, and our values, uh, especially our values. So consequently, we're going to have heterogeneity in care. Now, at the extremes, heterogeneity is unacceptable. Um, you know, not given a beta blocker to, you know, a healthy person who has an MI, that, that's just not that's kind of out of bounds. But within the reasonable spectrum of care, there's going to be heterogeneity in care because the, the patients are heterogeneous, the, prior, the providers are heterogeneous, the care context is, is heterogeneous, and especially goals of care are heterogeneous. So again, we have to accept that there's going to be heterogeneity in care. Next slide, please. And you know, I, I don't know, my experience, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, is that most people seem to get it. So, uh, you know, I, I, we always talk about how can we educate people about, about frailty. I, I, I don't think the general population needs much well, knowledge transfer. I, I think most of them get it. I, I'm sure if my mom's bridge club were listening to this talk, they would be wondering how I get paid to do this. Um, so I think most patients and families actually, if, 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 if with, with proper information, um, seem to get it. Next slide, please. So in summary, and this is all taken directly from, from Howard Bergman um, um, in, in Montreal. Um, this is literally cut and pasted. Um, so frailty provides a conceptual basis for moving away from an organ and disease-based approaches toward a health-based integrative one. And frailty may represent a key approach to improving the clinical care provided for at least a subset of older adults. And again, I think it's important to, defend, to stress that the vast, not the vast bulk, but the bulk of older adults are not, do not live with frailty. The vast bulk of older adults live in the frailty levels of one to three. 
And I think too, frailty used properly should say, this person is living with frailty, why and what can I do about it? Um, both to uh, prevent iatrogenesis, but also to, to improve their, their, their well-being. Uh, next slide, which is uh, not mine. Thanks. So, so just to, to wrap up sort of the stuff we talked about uh, first, um, there are um, ever improving tools to, to help clinicians with this uh, complex work and the clinical frailty scale is one of them. Um, and identifying uh, frailty, I think we've talked about this uh, uh, sort of repetitively now, it, but it triages the people who are going to benefit most from enhanced frailty uh, care. And this includes enhanced communication um, for high quality uh, healthcare. And uh, just reminding you of a little list of some of my some of my current favorites and thank you to Carly for getting those links in very uh, efficiently. So I think um, we both have our email addresses here, happy for any um, communications afterwards. And I'll mention while we wait and see if there are any hands that go up or questions, um, there is a parachute, an injury prevention um, set of webinars about managing medications and risks. And I'm um, doing one of those about uh, touching on sleep promotion um, in November. Thank you so much. And I just popped that link into the chat as well to those um, seminars. So thank you so much for this, both of you. Obviously, this has um, been a critical conversation for a long time. And I think the last two and a half years has really highlighted how critical of a conversation this is. So um, I just think this was such a timely talk and a timely session. We have we do have four minutes left, so we didn't get any questions in the chat, but I do want to open it up to see if anyone has questions or if anyone would like uh, to pop on. We've got a what a great presentation. Thank you. Um, anyone's feeling brave enough, ask a question, please feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat box for us. I'll direct them to my mom's bridge club. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's right. Well, and as we wait to see if anything comes in the chat on behalf of both um, Center for Healthcare Innovation and Shared Health, um, we want to thank you both for, for participating in this Canadian Patient Safety Week presentation. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to work with you both. Well, and thank you to everybody who uh, attended. Uh, that was uh, people people actually logged in after registering, which is very- yeah, It doesn't very always happen. I think I saw 88 people on. Got a couple of thank yous. Um, Nick Hargrove says, I agree with replacing the admitting diagnosis of failure to cope with failure to think. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Yeah, I think that's, a you know, the. the that, that it's kind of like nails on a chalkboard for geriatricians, the term failure to thrive or failure to cope or dyscopia. Um, um, so it, it, the reason is one, it's very pejorative. I don't think most of us would cope well with a broken hip. Um, and two, it simplifies the thinking and puts a label on somebody that then stops thinking. So I think Bill, there is one one question about how would you assess when a patient is unwilling to engage or participate? And I think that's the beauty of the approach of of having a plan to gather comprehensive information is that there are multiple sources that so one of the things just as a pearl would be really good documentation of what people offer are offered versus what they're willing to accept and what they demonstrate doing um, when when they're um, say let's say in the hospital what are they doing for themselves versus what are they what help are they needing from others and then any sources of information from prior to whatever is going on acutely and sometimes that takes some phone calls and some emails um, to 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 find out what information is out there, but um, there's a lot of comprehensive information being gathered. And if somebody's acutely delirious, maybe a little paranoid, there may be other sources of information, including their primary care provider. Right. So the question about choose assessments for determining length of stay is very complicated. So I don't have an ideal tool. If you go back to before I was born, like in, so in 1962, there was a paper that looked at length of stay. Um, and what seemed to drive length of stay was cognition, um, functional status, and social networks. And I think that's been validated very consistently in almost every healthcare system that doesn't force somebody out 
after a certain DRG. So the US is a little bit different for length of stay data. Um, so I, I think if we're looking to case mix adjust, one, we're never going to have a perfect tool that adjusts for all of the known confounding factors in length of stay. Um, two, we if we're going to measure length of stay and, and kind of benchmark it, we should at least measure some measure of functional status, some measure of cognition, and some measure of social factors, because we know those three things drive all outcomes, not just length of stay. Does that answer the question from, from the LOS question from B. Smith too? They say yes, thank you. Okay. It looks like you got both of the questions in there. There was um, a couple of comments. Um, one individual noted it would be good for frailty lens to be used in psychiatry settings as well, especially ER and, and crisis response. Yeah, it's all complexity. And that's the beauty of the, I mean, I'm Canadian biased, but that's the beauty of the accumulating deficits is it really doesn't matter what the um, um, accumulating um, challenges are uh, the 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 significance isn't the particular mix it's it's the accumulation of them good place to end mm -hmm. wonderful well, well thank you so much we're right at the hour and i'm sure people are rushing off to their one o'clock um, so thanks for everyone for joining us today for these rounds and thanks to both our presenters thank you bye-bye bye-bye